incident prevention mechanisms uh, which are established uh, uh, under the UMM and uh, um, uh, the UN uh, and, uh, and they are having meetings uh, bimonthly um, uh, and uh, the locations of the meetings are in Ergneti, which is the uh, closest place, village uh, uh, between Georgia and, and South Ossetian uh, uh, ADL, administrative boundary line. Uh, uh, and that's why it's called IPRM Ergneti. And another one is uh, between the Georgian and uh, Abkhazian uh, uh, ABL, uh, uh, located around the ABL um, in, in Gali. Uh, and that's why it's called uh, IPRM, uh, Gali IPRM. Uh, meetings. Um, so these are the mechanisms for peace processes and uh, 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 yeah, maybe we will uh, come back later to, to, to these mechanisms and, and how they are uh, effective or not. But generally speaking, uh, 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 as many scholars are uh, mentioning, uh, almost all the formats are uh, not effective uh, and uh, uh, despite uh, all the efforts uh, made by parties and by third party uh, neutral uh, uh, participants, um, uh, mediators, so this is still the, the not really effective uh, format and then that's why uh, we are facing huge difficulties to, to reach particular agreements between the parties. Um, maybe uh, uh, it, it, it's really important to, uh, to come back to the organization I represent um, uh, and then show you uh, what is the place of ICCN. Uh, um, within the peace process and within the uh, uh, stakeholders that are involved in peace process. So this is the uh, very scheme. Uh, uh, we are very much thankful for that, um, uh, made by University of Barcelona. Um, they are uh, uh, publishing a uh, yearbook uh, on all the peace processes uh, topics related to, to different countries that are facing problems, uh, uh, conflicts. Uh, and then this particular, uh, for instance, this particular yearbook was um, also uh, published by the UN Peacemaker uh, on their web, where we can see clearly the, the place of ICCN. Uh, uh, among that neutral party stakeholders that are involved uh, between uh, the parties involved in conflict. Uh, and uh, uh, we are really very proud of that uh, uh, composition and, and, and that uh, diagram, uh, which shows that uh, since its establishment, yeah, I'm just adding here, from my side that uh, since its establishment ICCN trying to, um, to, to provide parties of the conflict with particular conditions for the dialogue on peace. And in fact, ICCN is acting as a you know, uh, mediator between the parties. Uh, so it's all the programs and, and all the partners uh, uh, starting from the 1994 and ending uh, with nowadays and today's work. Uh, this is uh, the very uh, archive document uh, of the first registration of ICCN. Uh, uh, by the way, it's, it's uh, really the, the uh, topic to underline that we are very proud of our uh, archive, uh, ICCN holds. Uh, we are collecting a um, whole kind of uh, original documents that are related to 
um, conflict uh, and that conflict history of Georgia and South Caucasus. I really uh, want you all to visit our website and, and uh, uh, to enjoy with all the archive documents we are collecting again. Um, step by step are trying to, to publish everything. Uh, um, and uh, here I put uh, into words the mission of ICC and maybe it's better not to um, uh, put time for reading all this information uh, and then you will find everything in, in, on our web um, yourself. Um, and what we do, yeah, what is the, the main direction for us? This is, of course, uh, the uh, implementation of a dialogue uh, between uh, Georgians, Russians, Armenians, um, Azerbaijani representatives, uh, all the uh, six entities of South Caucasus, and maybe it's time to make more clear what we are uh, calling like six entities of South Caucasus. This is the very ICCN's approach uh, uh, to uh, keep the uh, trustful uh, attitude to, from our colleagues uh, involved uh, that represent the places involved in conflicts. Uh, these are three recognized and three non or partly recognized uh, places of South Caucasus. Uh, uh, we are providing stakeholders with the policy recommendations uh, uh, and of course are trying to empower civil society to become uh, engaged and present uh, within the, uh, their uh, uh, governments and uh, uh, their societies uh, in terms of uh, keeping at the same time activities dedicated to peace and peace building. Our method is to uh, remain impartial and transparent. Uh, now it's really important to underline and I would love to repeat that we never ever received any kind of financial assistance or any kind of other assistance from any of neighboring countries or governments of neighboring countries uh, uh, of Georgia. Yeah, this is really important in order to uh, uh, keep communication with all the representatives of different uh, parties involved in conflict. Uh, we are proud, as I mentioned already, to keep institutional memory. That's why we announced in 2007 that um, uh, we created the JOP database of peace agreements. Uh, uh, and uh, we have uh, about 500 um, electronic version of original signed uh, peace agreements uh, out of different types of negotiations between the parties. This is really a rare example of uh, uh, keeping institutional memory. Unfortunately, you cannot find any official institution in Georgia uh, or even in South Caucasus that are uh, providing for the free access all these type of uh, documentary base. Uh, and, uh, um, also, we are um, trying to be effective in planning and evaluating because, as you know, uh, this is additional topic when it comes to pit building and pit building activities. How to put the uh, the proper evaluation so uh, all the stakeholders, especially donors uh, or uh, entire uh, civil society institutions including media, they are becoming satisfied. Yeah, this is a specific direction we are trying to um, put our efforts to, to improve this information. Uh, uh, briefly about the uh, JOP database of Georgia. 
uh, we tried to organize the very first, uh, soon after launching the database, the very first um, presentation, invited a lot of interested um, institutions. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> we were not lucky to find um, financial resources to, to, to develop uh, that direction. Um, um, I don't know because uh, maybe this is the, the usual approach that uh, nobody want, want to, wants to wants to uh, to accumulate financial resources for that develop for that direction development. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, we are receiving thousands of emails so um, uh, young scholars. Uh, students that are working uh, in different countries or studying in different countries. Uh, they, these letters are just thank you letters for um, uh, having that capacity to provide them the, the particular documentation. Because when it comes to uh, precise research, when it comes to you know conflict analysis, this is uh, vital importance. Yeah, to, to have the particular sources of pure documents that are originally issued and then signed and uh, that acted as an enormous role in dialogue, in conflict resolution, in mediation, in every way. Yeah. Okay, now this is the very uh, uh, brief example, yeah, very uh, small example of uh, uh, the very process we are uh, working on still to uh, proceed all the data out of peace agreements and in particular we uh, uh, put the uh, different variables on, on our uh, 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 documentary base archive and uh, you you can see here uh, uh, the participation for instance yeah this is the variable about the gender provision of peace agreement we analyzed uh, in for, for this particular diagram we analyzed uh, 10 years uh, period of peace agreements of georgia and uh, there were just 4% of women participating in, uh, in dial process uh, that are signing the peace agreements. Yeah. Uh, um, I would like to mention here that uh, this uh, percentage of women uh, uh, includes the uh, participant women's, women's participation from parties involved in conflict and uh, the still the major part um, out of this four percent is uh, women that were participating in, uh, from the third neutral party side. Uh, yeah, this is the, the, the picture of um, women's engagement. So now you see uh, slowly we are moving towards the, the, the main issue we we discussed today. Uh, about engagement and, and participation, and in particular women's participation. Um, although I would love to just mention here the uh, general uh, and uh, the priority, I would say, um, problem for nowadays. Uh, um, uh, people that are living in uh, deceased territories uh, in South Caucasus. This is the freedom of movement for inhabitants of decision territories. Uh, um, in particular, uh, uh, we are raising the issue to make clear that um, uh, governments uh, of South Caucasian countries, they are uh, not ready and in particular I'm saying oh, okay I'm talking about Georgia. Um, government of Georgia is not ready to uh, uh, split the very basic human rights um, issue uh, with political recognition. 
And that's why uh, uh, in all documents we submitted to the government and to other interested stakeholders, we are uh, underlining that uh, inhabitants in Akwazim and South Ossetia um, are lacking the very basic human rights. Yes, they are never accepting to that. This is the freedom of travel. Um, how on international level uh, nowadays it is titled, uh, uh, but originally this is freedom of movement. Um, uh, and uh, this very situation is, uh, um, I would say, devastating the, the uh, daily life of the inhabitants uh, that are living in the uh, and uh, when it comes to confidence building measures, uh, uh, track two, track three, or other track uh, diplomacy meetings uh, may implement, uh, we are facing that problem uh, on, on our daily work. Um, uh, because uh, uh, we are bridging the very red lines um, identified by politicians and official representatives of the government. And, and, and this is the, really the challenge for uh, peace builders and peace practitioners that are trying to organize any kind of um, uh, communication, any kind of uh, uh, activity uh, involving the representatives of CC regions. Um, uh, another uh, Bacon of, of a problem is that another you know, container is the uh, uh, process of uh, building sustainable peace. Uh, in other words, the peace process itself, itself when it comes to civil society participation. Uh, um, national stakeholders uh, from the very grassroots level uh, and in particular, civil society are excluded, totally excluded from the track one negotiations. Um, at the same time, maybe uh, nowadays audience will write the question, how can we mix up the uh, track one and civil society's uh, uh, engagement and participation? But uh, we are discussing and observing the term of participation in a very broader way uh, because, for instance, the preparatory process um, uh, and pre-discussion uh, um, uh, pre of, for instance, agenda uh, for any kind of dialogue is also to be considered with the, uh, participation and engagement. And uh, in Georgia, we're totally lacking that, that very process. Um, at the same time, uh, once from today's participants, someone is aware of what is the uh, particular uh, uh, specificity of Georgia's Geneva dis uh, international discussions, um, then it would be really easy to explain that um, in particular, um, Geneva international discussions are participated by uh, physical persons. They are um, holding, they are named after them, you know, physical persons. They are never um, representing any kind of uh, uh, institution or a state agency or, uh, or a country. Uh, uh, so this is the one of the uh, major challenges and the specificities of Geneva International Discussions. And when it comes uh, this very, uh, you know, um, unformalized process, so we are now to raise the question then why we are never participating, I mean, entire, the entire society, the uh, relevant stakeholders, the interested stakeholders, to take part and to be engaged when, uh, when it comes to um, uh, bullet made, you know, uh, polished reports that are sent by our government to, I don't know, 
different UN agencies and then they are saying that they do care about women, peace and security and, and all this, you know, um, fashion terminology, yeah? But in fact, uh, the, uh, the official negotiations are distanced to, from the very grassroots level and then we are facing uh, on a daily basis um, a, a huge gap and vacuum, yeah, even in uh, accepting uh, information, direct information, what's going on, what we, what's happening there. Yeah, why uh, above us somewhere in sky there are made, you know, uh, or not made decisions about, you know, the, the hidden topic. So this is the, 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 the really process. Um, at the same time, I uh, uh, would love to uh, mention the uh, theoretical approach on peace process. When we all agree that peace process, generally speaking, contains three integral pillars that are governmental officials, that are third neutral parties, and that are peace practitioners, and then all these three integral pillars to be interconnected and then two way at least communication to be said. You know, we are in Georgia facing still the very division and uh, I would say discrimination, yeah, because uh, the peace practitioners are never. Uh, Never on place. Yeah. We are never in the same boat, uh, despite all the efforts and and, and despite uh, all the I don't know uh, decades of uh, having experience working and uh, having faces and names that are uh, working in the field uh, already about three zero yeah thirty years. Can you imagine what is the, the, the approach to these um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, non-governmental activities, uh, how, how we are titled and, and called. Uh, and, uh, also, uh, I'm writing here today for your, um, I don't know, for your interest, for your attention, the very Mm, uh, serious problem when uh, peace practitioners themselves in my region are never protected. Uh, and then still all this is happening uh, under the uh, very um, uh, huge history having, you know, approach of human peace and security, yeah? that appeared soon after 2000 when uh, the first UN Security Council resolution uh, was adopted. Uh, can you imagine that uh, human rights defenders, uh, they are protected. Uh, dozens of international uh, legal documents are binding uh, member states or participating states uh, to protect them, to, to create all the, you know, uh, uh, conditions for their effective work, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we all know all these documents very well. We all know the uh, uh, European countries, how they are even implement, creating and implementing action, national action plans, how to protect human rights. But when it comes to peace practitioners, who is there to protect? Who is there to think that uh, we are in many cases, I would say in all cases, can you imagine, forced to apply to uh, Chatham House rule. So this is really, really a very case for past conflict dialogue processes, for past conflict confidence building measure activities. You know why? Because we have to, we are to hide participants, hide list of participants, um, never take photos or never publish photos, because all these people, all these people are to go back to their home place, 
and we have dozens of examples of having you know serious pressure on them uh, even more we have cases in my region when they are in prison and then this is really a serious direction what what to be done yeah on the one hand yes after 2016 un made a great step towards uh, uh, um, underlining the meaning of sustainable peace, uh, the meaning of uh, peace agenda, the meaning of mediation. Yeah? Uh, they put forward uh, the, the readiness of all the member states to support this direction. And enormous funds are allocated to implement all this direction. On the other hand, on the very grassroots level, in my region, in my country, you know, we are never recognized and never legitimate to do our work, to continue our work for the peace direction, peace building direction. We, we are left without any kind of approach and any kind of protection. Now I am sitting here on, on this slide, almost everything I, I provided you. Uh, and uh, uh, in other words, I do not want much to take your time because um, I, I know my colleague now is also having very interesting uh, uh, presentation uh, to prepare and, and we have to leave the, the time for our communication or questions, but um, having in mind all this specific yeah. Uh, uh, we still did something. And uh, maybe here is the, the very good, uh, 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 a very good window opportunity to, to say thank you for GPAC, uh, who is always supportive to all kinds of very, you know, uh, tough ideas we are uh, providing from our region. Uh, and yes, we were supported to establish uh, and, and think how to make more stronger the very local, national, and regional stakeholders. Uh, uh, this is the very network of women mediators we created, uh, initiated the, the uh, very um, um, hard work, I would say. Yeah? To, to to have all the women on, on on the same page, on the same mood, uh, to to let them uh, that very hope that um, it is still possible to do that. We we have to unite our efforts so we are properly recognized and legitimized and engaged at the end. Of and this is the very uh, information about our network. So uh, what else? Please, again, visit our website and then you will maybe find uh, more information. And uh, I'm looking very much forward to our discussion. And, uh, and in other way, yeah, uh, all this activity, yeah, including today's discussion, is the very act of solidarity. Thank you very much for that. Thank, okay, you. Th th thank you very much, Nina, for this uh, insightful presentation. And you, you. you mentioned some very important uh, questions and dilemmas I think all peace practitioners are faced with. Uh, I would like to thank you for that, first of all, at the general level because many of us feel that we are completely unprotected in our own regions and that we are faced often with uh, certain problems in our society or at least we are not accepted as well as we would like to be. And definitely there are no law regulations that are protect us. Uh, as, as you mentioned, people who fight for human rights really can uh, feel safe because they know that the laws are protecting. And for us, we still have to figure out 
and actually the network uh, gives us uh, strength and solidarity you also mentioned that so that is something that we all uh, appreciate but i also like to, to thank you for giving us uh, the background of the whole situation of your long-term work in the South Caucasus, that is, you, you said 30 years, which is really amazing and uh, really important work that you and your colleagues are doing in the region. So uh, I would like to ask our audience, do, do we have any questions for Nina now? And then we will continue with Zal's presentation. Okay, Tanya, then I'm muting my mic and uh, I'm staying with you. Sorry, say it again. Just I, I'm like... muting my mic and then staying with you. Okay, yes, yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. It seems that we, we don't have questions for Nina. Or maybe I can ask uh, one. You, you mentioned that the situation is. Uh, not easy to to say the least but how do you see your your work in in the near future nina can you can you tell us what are the the main focuses for you at the moment yeah uh, tanya the uh, um, the situation is that uh, for the last two years we tried to 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 really lobby the, this very issue we uh, all the co-chairs of GID. Uh, and in fact, we reached some, uh, the, I would say, yeah, uh, consensus, let's say so, yeah. We reached some uh, uh, results. Uh, as a fact, they started very recently and they promised us to, uh, to set additional uh, preparatory meeting with women uh, before the uh, rounds uh, in Geneva to discuss the very issues of women, peace, and security. Yeah. Uh, but um, this is um, not, not at all enough. Yeah. This is just a uh, you know, very first try how to think about more uh, effective engagement, yeah. real engagement of, of the civil society, not only women, yeah, I would say. Um, so this is uh, just only uh, uh, blossom we reached uh, for now, and then we have to keep working and, and keep continuing the, the very you know um, uh, lobbying process, yeah, advocacy process. In okay. that that term, we we are looking forward for more uh, more and more uh, support from the GIFO Foundation in terms of, you know, I don't know, yeah, drafting and uh, 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 publishing and sending more statements uh, uh, and particular yeah, actions to the regional and international stakeholders to, to develop and to transform this very problematic issue to, con to con uh, convert the situation to the real engagement of the civil society, track one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer, Nina. Uh, do we have questions now? Maybe someone remembered any important question? Okay, if not, then I would like to, to give the floor to my colleague Zal to continue with presentation about uh, his part of work uh, in South Caucasus together with Nina and other colleagues. Zal, can we see your screen? Can you share the screen with us? Probably we have some technical issues here. Zal, are you online with us?
Can I ask my colleagues from Secretariat to check? I cannot hear Zal's voice, so probably he is not connected. If you can help him with any technical problems. Aha, uh -huh, here is Zal. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, perfect. Hello, Zal, how are you? Hello, how are you? I'm fine, how about you? Yes, I'm very well. I'm glad that you joined us. Me too. Uh, mm -hmm. So, can you see the screen now? No, not yet. If you can share it with us. Uh -huh. Just a second. Just a second. Yes, no, no worries. It is important that it works. Just try to find it. Yeah. Okay. You have the button that says share. Okay. Uh -huh. On the left, it says join audio, and you did that, and now there is the screen. The yeah, yeah, I see, but uh, uh -huh. uh, okay. So can you can you see the screen yes. now? Yeah, yeah, perfect, very good. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay. it's full full screen, full uh, screen now. Yeah, can okay. everyone can now, everyone see? Please. Yes, yes, I can see it. I can see. It. So, does uh, everyone uh, see the screen? Yes, it's visible for me. I can see it. Okay, okay. So, uh, welcome everybody. I'm happy to be with you. And um, the next session will be devoted uh, to the adaptive leadership uh, uh, pertinent to the human security in the conflict zones or in the conflict um, uh, situation. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, uh, most of our audience members are familiar what is adaptive leadership. Uh, uh, but now I would like to ask you to answer one question for me. What do you think and how do you, which picture better suits adaptive leadership, left or the right? Mm -hmm. That is a good question. Anyone wants to answer? Well, my first uh, reaction would be the first one, the first photo. First one, okay. Other responses? Anyone else from the audience? So you, you think okay, that I would, I, I would I would say the second because it is juggling everything time. Yes, I agree with you. The tools and so on, and the first picture shows leadership. Because uh, once we are talking about adapting leadership, uh, we we are talking about the specific style of leadership, uh, which is maybe relatively new for many. But on the other hand, it's. Uh, at most importance when uh, uh, one uh, is operating in a complex uh, environment. Uh, so um, uh, I think that uh, uh, why I've chosen this uh, uh, topic from the, the big, uh, book about human security, because based on Georgian uh, experience, I, fa I found that the uh, uh, the possession of the skills of adaptive leadership uh, is very, very helpful uh, in uh, handling uh, uh, some difficult uh, situations which frequently arise uh, in the conflict zones or in the complex uh, situations. And uh, I think uh, it's worth to, uh, talking about what is uh, adaptive leadership, how it can be applied, uh, what are the benefits of this adaptive leadership in the conflict prevention process. And because uh, we are living in the uh, we are living in the complex uh, world full of uncertainties, challenges, unpredictable and often conflict prone situations and therefore adapting to complex environment with its constant changes and, and challenges is very important for those who decided to take the role of a leader in such kind of environments. Certainly, the, the fast-paced and challenging environment requires 
from potential leaders possessing respective skills, knowledge, and habits to cope with the conflict from situations, as I have said, and or actual conflicts if, if they exist in, in order to prevent their escalation. Therefore, to be able to face and handle these constant challenges and changes, leaders operating in the conflict environments, including conflict zones and adjacent regions, uh, which uh, and in Georgia, we had two, uh, two frozen conflicts, and with the adjacent regions where uh, the acts of violence uh, occur from time to time, uh, the adaptive leadership is very important. Uh, uh, so, and uh, adaptive leaders are expected to change their approaches and adopt more adaptive style. Uh, so, generally, uh, as you know, the leadership uh, involves two main things, uh, uh, and uh, I, would, uh, I can uh, just uh, divide them into two big portions of the real and skill. Uh, but uh, the question is how you are applying this real and skill of leadership in the specific situation, in the complex environment. The experience and evidence from a number of conflict zones uh, show the traditional leadership uh, techniques focused on driving alignment and control, uh, which uh, you saw on the first picture when the woman with the, with the flag in her hand tried to uh, lead uh, the crowd and uh, just, uh, you know, taking uh, the, the people to the certain direction. This is a kind of a style of a common and control leadership, but uh, uh, this kind of leadership uh, often becomes ineffective and inefficient uh, if used alone in terms of emergent changes, and challenges, ambiguity, strength, which are all present in a complex environment. And if you apply adaptive leadership to the United Nations Human Security Framework, this means that adaptive leader should be well aware and well versed in all aspects of human security. The ages of threat to human lives and know the best strategies to address them. So what is adaptive leadership? Uh, as you see in the, the slide, this is a uh, style of helping it to adapt to constantly changing dynamics, as I said. But this is a uh, style of leadership when the leader possesses the skills and intercultural competence, coordination, and conflict assessment. And uh, he or she has an ability to adapt to religious, ethnic, and other differences, which uh, always take place in the conflict situation where the many stakeholders are present. And they have different uh, and sometimes very, very conflict interests. And of course, a good, good adaptive leader uh, can negotiate well and uh, be able to uh, to prevent conflicts to the extent uh, possible. And uh, certainly, uh, adaptive leadership involves abilities for strategic, operational, and tactical civil military force coordination in a complex environment because uh, uh, everyone who lives in the conflict zone or is familiar with the situation there knows that uh, in this in the conflict zone, uh, there is a presence of police, security forces, uh, local authorities, uh, local population, and many, many different interest groups and stakeholders. Yeah? And uh, among these uh, stakeholders and the interest groups, they might be dividers and connectors who might contribute to the conflict escalation or otherwise to contribute to the relief of the conflict. Um, now I will try to just present you the profile of adaptive leader and then each of you can decide uh, whether you fit uh, this uh, profile. Uh, and uh, if you decide uh, any time to become an adaptive leader then take a leader of the situation in the conflict environment. Uh, so first of all, this means that the adaptive leader Accept the complex environment with its unclear situation and uncertainty. 
yes, uh, he or she you know, always finds a way to understand the motivations and patterns of behavior of other stakeholders, because without the skill and without this, uh, without this habit, uh, hardly you know, one can become an adaptive leader. And of course, uh, he or she listens to many different points of view, learns and shares information proactively and demonstrates the courage to make difficult and even risky decisions. We will uh, talk about it later. Uh, to be frank, uh, how, uh, as a, how does it compare an adaptive leader to a doctor, to a medical doctor who, uh, who tries to heal uh, some, uh, some diseases, but uh, at the same time, it takes care not to harm other uh, uh, parts of the human organism and don't to cause it adverse effects. That's why uh, uh, adaptive leaders uh, should follow the well-known principle, uh, which uh, which uh, its medicine is bad that uh, more than most of it uh, do not harm. Uh, we are continuing uh, the profile of uh, adaptive uh, leaders. So uh, this person we usually communicates, coordinates, and uh, is able to build relations. So, with all stakeholders, notwithstanding their attitudes, uh, position, whatever aggressive they might uh, seem uh, at a glance, uh, and uh, or finds areas of cooperation between different stakeholders. But in order to find the uh, areas of cooperation between these or uh, among the stakeholders and give them the floor for expression of their concerns, grievances, attitude, you should and you should first bring them together. And it, it costs huge effort, a lot of time, to be able to bring them to, uh, together with their conflicting and often contradictory interests and uh, aspirations. And in this, in this situation, a good adaptive leader uh, can even improvise and go on the way of trial and error and uh, do this by learning and evaluation because uh, adaptive leadership is a constant uh, process of learning. We are learning in our mistake. We are learning lessons which uh, we uh, retrieve uh, from a different kind of situation that we encounter in, in while uh, working in the conflict uh, zones. And uh, we try to, we try to uh, generate uh, common vision to the extent possible. And uh, what is necessary for that? One of the qualities which a doctor leader must possess is to think out of the box. Try to think out of the box, uh, even if it's, uh, it's very difficult for you. Uh, and uh, to, uh, to cope with conflict, uh, it's uh, necessary, to, first of all, to make a very a fair and unbiased assessment of the of the context of the, of the conflict. And uh, what I would like to emphasize uh, in this respect that when, the, when you are doing the assessment of the situation, you are doing the assessment of the conflict, please try to avoid your personal preferences and uh, stay unbiased. Stay unbiased and uh, uh, look at the situation as a side observer, whatever preferences you might, might have, and maybe you, you favor the one side of the conflict uh, and, and uh, not favor other, but stay, stay unbiased. Why I'm underlining uh, this uh, uh, moment? Because uh, if uh, participants in the conflict, if stakeholders notice that you are biased, you will lose your credibility. As soon as you lose the credibility, no one will accept you as an adaptive leader. And you can safely exit from the situation uh, and give place to other persons. Uh, and uh, one of the important uh, tasks which uh, adaptive leaders usually uh, handle when they try to uh, preserve a human security in the civil conflict situation is to make a, uh, uh, risky decisions, but, uh, making a risky decision, 
uh, decisions, uh, as we call it, call it uh, taking smart risks. Uh, uh, smart risks, uh, it's, it, under no circumstances, it means kind of taking kind of reckless risk and uh, uh, that pose risk to the uh, conditions and lives of other people. Your risks should be very well calculated, very well calculated, and uh, you should uh, weigh very carefully all pros and cons in unpredictable environment. The, and that's why I strongly recommend you to uh, create a matrix of risks uh, and uh, create the risks uh, by the severity. For example, where is the probability of risk is low, middle, or high, and of course, uh, uh, apply the strategy of mitigation of each risk because uh, the listing of risk for the risk, of course, it is not uh, sufficient and uh, it will not uh, do the work uh, which we want it to, to do. And uh, you might uh, face the uh, necessity to make a compromise when uh, trying to bring together uh, different stakeholders because the art of uh, Compromise is uh, art which uh, requires uh, constant refinement uh, and uh, it's a very difficult uh, task. But uh, I want to warn uh, from doing one uh, thing which is, I think, is very important. Even uh, when you try to make compromise, stick to your principles and never, never violate your integrity as a leader because. If uh, you sacrifice your leader's integrity, making compromises, um, most likely you would it be considered as a uh, leader when using in integrity means that uh, adaptive and uh, leaders uh, can uh, uh, lose the uh, the reins of this uh, situation. And uh, this, uh, I would say, is a catastrophe for, for any person who pretends on the all of the adaptive leaders. And then uh, um, always seek for win-win solutions when, and try to bring stakeholders together to make them to develop solutions that addressing their main interests. Why it's important to uh, seek your win win solution. I think uh, our audience uh, is quite, is composed of quite experienced people and they know quite important. But I would like to emphasize one thing because if any side of the conflict finds uh, itself defeated, uh, uh, it, it may agree uh, temporarily with the terms of the peace imposed on him, but uh, uh, this side of conflict may take time to regain forces and then start fight again because he feels himself himself defeated. He feels that uh, there was a no decision and uh, one side uh, emerged the winner and the uh, other side loser. So uh, adaptive leader always uh, tries to seek uh, Universal solutions, and I think uh, it's an uh, axiom for any uh, peacemaking uh, uh, process. Uh, and uh, adaptive leaders, adaptive leaders always set uh, an example for others. So you are an exemplary person for the whole community, whole constituencies. They trust you. They are ready to follow you uh, when uh, uh, tackle with the conflict situation. And uh, if you want people to follow work for you, you should uh, demonstrate an example of a person with a high level of integrity, trustworthy uh, person. Um, now I would like to uh, tell you one thing. Uh, which uh, sounds maybe like it's a kind of warning or recommendation or 
advice or whatever. To assess your own skills and personal qualities to determine whether you are the right person to intervene as an adaptive leader. If you suspect that if you are unsure, if you think that you are not ready for this mission, please uh, uh, refuse to do it uh, until you get ready and uh, leave this function to other persons who might be a better candidate for, for that. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we frequently speaking uh, and, uh, about the equal engagement uh, of uh, men and uh, women uh, in the conflict uh, prevention activities. What I would like to tell you is that the conflicts, uh, conflicts environments and the conflict situation require leadership from both men and women. Men and women share leadership, and the sharing of leadership, uh, as experience shows, uh, brings the better results uh, in comparison when only men uh, occupy uh, this function and uh, women, uh, women are kind of uh, out of the out of the business. And uh, UN security resolutions. Uh, Reframes the positive contributions uh, uh, of women uh, to the peace and security. There are plenty of examples of that. Uh, uh, plenty of how women contributed to peace and uh, security and uh, uh, the establishment of the network of women mediators. So, uh, what Nina uh, told uh, in her presentation is also one of the confirmations that uh, our organization is very serious attention and uh, that takes uh, efforts to, uh, to engagement of uh, women in the confidence building and conflict prevention as much as, uh, as possible. Yes, I understand that uh, it's uh, connected with the traditions, the religious, cultural issues in different countries, but uh, according to my, uh, to my notes, uh, the Increasing the engagement of women in the peace building and uh, peace building and uh, confidence building the activities uh, is a reality. And uh, one of the uh, vivid evidence of that is the existence of uh, women mediation networks worldwide in different uh, parts of the world uh, uh, who are quite industrious uh, in the peacemaking and uh, confidence. Uh, uh, building activity. And one thing uh, which I would like to add is uh, adaptive uh, uh, leaders, uh, adaptive leaders have a skill and ability to uh, look beyond what people are saying. Uh, yes, I understand that this uh, skill uh, is dif difficult to acquire uh, the training. So maybe uh, this is a specific hab habit of this people to, to just, uh, uh, or specific habit of leadership, to just look beyond uh, what the, uh, the uh, people say and uh, think of how to box, uh, uh, because uh, again, I want to uh, go back to what I have said at the beginning, that the complex environment is a very unpredictable environment, and, and uh, frequently uh, you, will be forced uh, to change your fixed plan with, which you have elaborated at the beginning. And uh, uh, this complex situation often requires uh, adaptive leaders to change their uh, initial plans and uh, analyze the behavior and interest of stakeholders daily, even hourly, if a conflict situation es escalates. Uh, so if you you decided uh, to become an adaptive leader, so prepare yourself for that. So this is uh, my uh, advice. And now, if we have time, if we have time, I would like to tell you three examples. I would say uh, people's stories, people's stories uh, uh, of uh, uh, Georgian women uh, leaders, uh, uh, which I think, in my opinion, uh, are real adaptive um, leaders. Uh, uh, one is uh, Lea Michelazzi. 
She's a community leader leading in the um, area adjacent to the Georgian Ossetian, uh, Ossetian conflict uh, zone. And uh, when the summer uh, climatic conditions and how uh, significantly affected the population of the three villages located near the administrative border, having eliminated 80% of their harvest, the villagers, uh, the villagers faced economic crisis. The adaptive community leaders, uh, uh, led by Lia Mikeladze, who were previously drilled by the Association of IDP Women concept, uh, on consent, helped the social vulnerable local population with new essentials and everyday food that managed, and, and what's important, they managed to involve ethnic Ossetians in this process from the other side of the border because they, they were also affected with this climatic uh, conditions. They did not approve or impose anything on them, but negotiated the way uh, which motivated the ethnic associations to engage in the project of assistance together with the ethnic Georgians. The participation of the project eventually cultivated the rebuilding contrast between Georgian uh, associations and prompt them for more, co more cooperation and the joint activities for development of the infrastructure of villages. Of course, I am far from the uh, intention to paint kind of rosy picture, but uh, this contribution at this time helped to rebuild the trust even on the small spot uh, of this uh, conflict uh, uh, of the conflict uh, area. Um, but uh, of course, we, uh, we cannot uh, close the eyes on the gloomy uh, realities that the organization uh, uh, process continues and the uh, association border guard backed by Russian military continue to install this rock wires and uh, checkpoints and closing the access of Georgia villagers to their farm states. This is an example of how the politics can. Uh, Interfere into the good, uh, uh, in, into the good uh, efforts of building of building the people's uh, diplomacy. The second uh, second uh, story which I would like to tell is the story of Lia Chlachize, who is a teacher by trade, and then she moved to the newspaper to give coverage to war and peace issues and cultivate friendship between the Georgian and Ossetians by her. So, for future stories. And uh, uh, Leah overcame uh, herself when engaged in the confidence building as a community leader because it was very difficult for her because uh, her husband had fallen victim of the first Georgian possession art conflict in 1990. Leah tries to set an example of tolerance, patience, empathy, and compassion for others by sharing her knowledge and skills of responsiveness and sensitivity to other problems. So it's why she is an knowledge community leader in her area and the locals willingly voted for her at the municipal election to the city council. They always says and her, her, her slogan is to trust the people. This is uh, her golden rule of when dealing with complex and conflict situations and the various stakeholders. When speaking about public diplomacy, we are a fervent advocate of greater engagement of women in, in the peace building activities. She believes in women diplomacy, which often, often helps in conflict prevention in the situation uh, based on the local cultural habits and image and behaviors so of a strong woman makes other side to deal with her with uh, seriousness and esteem. Uh, Leah arranged a war museum at her home, which, which is situated in the Ergnati village, right at the vicinity of the conflict zone's demarcation line. She relocated to the museum the part of her house uh, that uh, remained un undamaged after the 2008 August war between Georgia and Russia. The museum contains war related items, photo, video, and audio materials, and serves for increasing anti-war anti moods and awareness for conflict prevention 
sensitizing future generations and international stakeholders and visitors uh, uh, that uh, it's necessary to do everything to prevent in the war. So in a way, this in a way to report by me, which are the probably is, uh, uh, I think, with good evidence for, for capability to act and uh, adapt to And the last example is the example of Nazi Nishwiliani, who will be a civic activist woman, editor of the regional newspaper, Charlotte Express. She applied her adaptive leadership skills to address violence during the Georgian Arcos conflict in 1993. She was one of the mediators between the conflicting parties and used her skills, knowledge, and personal qualities to rescue uh, uncaptivated Georgian soldiers from captivity and exchange them for the Abkhaz war prisoners. She, then she wrote a very thrilling essay, a tearful tweet describing her endeavors for freeing the captives and war prisoners. Uh, for her contribution and merits in the confidence building and the role in freeing the war prisoners to the hostilities, uh, Nazi Meshwaliano was listed in the book 100, prominent, 100 Most Prominent Georgian Women. So that's it, what uh, I would like to tell you. Uh, on the last slide, you see the Adaptive Leadership and Human Security Index. Uh, uh, and uh, this is a, and a list of the problems which uh, compose the whole Human Security Index. And uh, you can see uh, uh, there are too many problems, too many issues affecting the people's life uh, in the in the complex environment, in the, in the complex zone, and the adaptive leaders uh, have to uh, deal with these problems. Uh, and this uh, underlines again how many skills they should uh, uh, acquire to be able to find an uh, uh, acceptable solution to all these problems which are listed uh, here in this. Uh, Human Security Index list. Uh, uh, so, uh, I think uh, we have. I have exceeded a bit of my time, and then so I'm, I want to thank you again for coming to this webinar, and I'm ready to answer your questions if any. Thank you very much, Zal. I, I think that this was time well spent. You you gave us uh, some tools. You gave us. Uh, life stories which is which are precious i particularly like those examples that you gave at the end because these are real people we are talking about and you shared their experiences so that was great and also if i briefly want to sum up just to remind people and then they can ask questions you you talked a lot about uh, the leadership uh, modern leader actually that's how i call it someone who who leads the team on, of individuals is, is aware of the capacities of those individuals. But I also found it very useful to, to hear your explanation about uh, making decisions, uh, decision making process, and uh, how leaders can uh, make uh, smart risks actually, and what does it take, and how to keep the identity along the way in the midst of everything we are, we are doing. So um, uh, it seems to me that uh, you, you talked about uh, the leader who is willing to learn all the time, to learn from the process and from the people alike. And you also put it very nicely that uh, we need to take care to uh, listen tentatively to both words, but also to nonverbal communication, because you said go beyond what people say. Yes, of course. That is, that is really a good lesson for me. So, <laughs> and how women and men can share leadership, uh, that is also something that we are all still learning in our societies, or at least we are trying to make good examples to our decision makers in, in different uh, at different levels of, of society, actually, to to be examples for that. So, a really rich presentation. Thank you very much once again. And in order not to take too much time for questions, I would like to to ask people who are listening uh, tentatively. Do you have any questions? Uh, well, 
this is just an insight. Thank you very much, first of all, Nina and Zal. It was uh, really, truly motivating presentations by both of you. So I'm coming from Nansen Dialogue Center Serbia, which is part of Nansen Dialogue Network. And as you know, we are also working in post-conflict areas of former Yugoslavia. And I could uh, link to both of your presentations and uh, I could, you know, uh, make links with the challenges that we are facing as builders in our regions. And for Zal, uh, uh, it was particularly interesting for me uh, to look at the, these aspects of uh, adaptive leadership. And I was thinking uh, how we can implement it in the field. And I really like the uh, practical example that you mentioned about uh, a, a woman uh, called Leah. Uh, and uh, her efforts in confidence building, as I could also relate it to our work in the region, how important it is to build confidence among the parties that used to be in war, in armed conflict. And I believe this is also one of the most important aspects of being adaptive leader in such contexts. So this is just an observation and thank you very much for really insightful presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Can you can you say the name Dragon? I can recognize your name and the position. Yeah, please. me me as well, Dragana. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. So, Dragana, can you introduce yourself? My name is Dragana Sharengacha, and I work for Nansen Dialogue Center Serbia. I'm a regional cooperation coordinator, and we are also member of GPAC for uh, from the beginning. And I also work as GPAC Western Balkans Regional Liaison Officer. Okay, thank you. Do we have more questions, observations from participants? No questions. <laughs> 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 I think that everything was very clear, Zal. <laughs> yeah, I, I assume we, we discussed so many sad issues. Yeah, that 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 maybe uh, 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 both uh -huh, of participants. Someone, someone is okay. Sorry, Nina, I, I interrupted you, but I think that someone was trying. Yeah, to yeah, to ask I, 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 I've heard as well. Yeah. Okay. We can hear the colleague now who, who wanted to ask the question. It seems like someone from the background was trying to, to say something, but... Hey. Um, yes, I have one question actually. I'm not sure if you discussed it already uh, because it came a bit later into the seminar. Because, um, but I was wondering how do you keep the balance and how to promote uh, establishment of women's fora and leadership also taking social yeah, sensitivity. It's a wonderful hearing. I cannot hear. Cannot hear. Yes, there, there is a lot of background noise. I'm sorry, but if you can repeat once again your question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm in the middle of uh, of our library right now, so there's a bit of uh, there's quite a lot of background noise. Um, my question was how to promote uh, the establishment of women's fora and leadership. Uh -huh. Also taking into account cultural sensitivity. And if there's any like specific tips or uh, methods that you can use. So I I cannot uh, uh, recognize the words. This is sort of the sharing this a little bit bad. Maybe the idea is if, if you can type your question in the chat. I can hear something about women cooperation, but I'm also not sure. So if you can type the question, I will read it. Now, now we have the question in the chat. Thank you, Amanda. I'm sorry, but we, we couldn't hear you. My question was how to promote the establishment of women's uh, fora and leadership while taking into account cultural sensitivity. 
Yes. 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 This is uh, exactly for me. Uh, it should be Chipaki uh, uh, Human uh, Security Handbook when uh, uh, discussing this uh, adaptive uh, leadership uh, issue. Uh, of course, takes in, into account this uh, problems which our colleague has mentioned. Yes, uh, in uh, some. Uh, cultural in environments uh, and uh, in some religious communities, the uh, collective participation of women, any kind of civic participation uh, to say nothing about the engagement in the in, uh, uh, building uh, activities uh, is not welcomed to say such a way. And uh, sometimes it uh, receives uh, uh, Peers' resistance from their families, from the community. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, I think that uh, the courage is necessary for uh, the women to set an example uh, to break the ice, to say in other words, uh, because uh, without courage, without uh, without the kind of uh, uh, readiness uh, to, to overcome these uh, obstacles, uh, you will never uh, have the opportunity to engage in the peacemaking activities. I understand fully that uh, this cannot uh, happen overnight, but uh, step by step, or uh, maybe through the educational processes, through the uh, seminars or uh, uh, the meetings, you can uh, explain the people who are against this that uh, what is the worst uh, under what is the worthiness of the human engagement you see uh, uh, when people uh, stay uninformed uninformed the uh, the uninformed or, or misinformation is a source of uh, all this it's a reason for wrong decisions, wrong approach, and wrong approach is a source of conflict in itself. So uh, the way out uh, of the situation is a constant education and constant interaction to persuade them uh, how human engagement in this uh, kind of processes is important for this community itself. Thank you very much, Zal. This was a really detailed answer. I hope it answered Amanda's question. Have we got anyone else from the audience? Please feel free to ask the questions. It seems no. Uh, if not, I, if Zal and Nina, if you want to say some final concluding sentences, then I think that we can end our webinar there. Yeah, I, I, I would say, uh, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, you know, one, one important thing is uh, that we are managing all of our work everywhere in the world. We people that are working within the, you know, uh, the uh, unsafe and fragile peace building, yeah, we are uh, in, in many cases titling yeah, uh, on our documents like this sustaining approach, yeah, but still we, we have to deal on, on our daily base, daily work with, you know, uncertain, you know, circumstances. Uh, of uh, political or societal treasure, uh, I am making linkage to, you know, cultural sensitivities as well. Uh, 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 but at the same time, uh, uh, for me on a personal level, it is really very much encouraging when, uh, when we can and we are organizing this kind of, you know, uh, warm and tiny communication uh, webinars, which are very much helpful to once more uh, uh, review and uh, imagine and uh, verbalize 
what is happening in reality yeah and then how can we uh, i don't know better assist each other uh even being you know distance physically from each other but still uh, hoping that uh, something may really happen yeah something is really done and then uh, thank you very much for this feel and then for this imagination I, I am really pleased deeply touched to 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 have a possibility to 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 be with you for this one and a half hour and then and, and speak about the uh, uh, challenges we are facing and and i'm sure we all i mean you as well are uh, facing uh, maybe not the same uh, and similar problems but still there is you know uh, no safe approach still uh, once um, uh, considering yourself as an you know peace practitioner peace builder peace activist yeah and then we all have to think about that more to lobby somehow to 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 put to draw attention particular attention not only on international level but on national as well thank you thank you very much nina thank you very much for giving the opportunity to share our uh, georgian experience and uh, our thoughts to the audience i think that uh, the initiative to organize such kind of webinars uh, uh, when we discussed it at our working group meetings uh, uh, has uh, finally fleshed out to things uh, and uh, I welcome that uh, these webinars will continue and that it's a very uh, important uh, contribution to at least uh, share experience between the people in different parts of the world and uh, learn the learn the, what is happening uh, there and uh, so because uh, this is uh, what uh, we need uh, 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 among other things to know each other better and uh, know experiences of each of each other better because this uh, enriches our knowledge and our experience thank you again thank you zal and uh... Thank you very much for your patience, everyone who were with us for one hour and a half. And uh, same the, as with other webinars, this webinar will be on the website of uh, GPOC Foundation, accessible to, to all of you who didn't have time to listen to, to the whole presentation. Or if you want to recommend it to your colleagues, feel free. Thank you and bye for now. Thank you very much. Thanks. Compliments you. to your great work, Zal and Nina. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.